Slammy, Ego, Slammy, Ego, Slammy, Ego, Slammy, Ego, You already know what's up. What's that? Another home run. Cause you know the job ain't done. Till we hold that trophy up. What's up, everybody? Welcome, episode 584 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show. Jim Russell is the special guest of this show. He's already smiling. We're already off to an uh, interesting start here. 584. So, Jim, that's a yeah. that's a lot, man. <laughs> hey, if you guys kept track of the number of episodes, it's just something that I mean, I don't need to do it, but I just did it from the very start, so I just kept doing it. If you guys did that too on the wrap up show, I'm sure you guys would be pretty darn high as well so like i guess props to both of us for continuing to follow this poor offense it's a grind and uh yeah we're just like the padres we're grinding every day yeah for sure so let's let's start out with that with this this offense i get it we're what 12 games into this season but how frustrating is it on a scale of one to ten right now ten being the most um just watching we're just getting flashbacks of 2023 and i know that fans are probably like stop talking about 2023 it's a new year but it's hard to not mention 2023 when this team has gotten off to this start it's it is frustrating um but it's not as i mean it's it's hard to think back to last year because you want to like forget about last year as much as possible and you know this team this past week in general just two runs two runs three runs two runs four runs two runs um and you've gotten great pitching, and you've only got two wins out of the last week. It is frustrating, but there are signs that they are doing better than last year. While the run production is still like the issue, you know, they've been a lot better with runners in scoring position. Their team OPS is 10th in baseball this season. Last year's team with runners in scoring position at this time last year, you know, it just was a constant, you know, just downhill production for the for the first half of the season and for pretty much three fourths of the entire year until the last month of the season. Um, it, it's a frustrating watch because you know they they should be better or at least you want them to be better. And I just go back to the three guys in this lineup that this franchise and team are kind of putting the all the brunt of the load on their back is Manny Machado, Fernando Tatis Jr., Xander Bogarts. Tatis has been pretty good this season mm -hmm. um for you know for only being in you know 10 11 games, right? Xander Bogarts you have real questions about Xander Bogarts, real big questions about him because he's not hitting for any power. He has one extra base hit this year and his barrel rate is extremely low. For a guy that's being paid $280, $280 million, you expect more. And then Manny Machado coming off the year he had last year, getting the surgery, and you, you say to yourself, all right, how – you ask the question, how can this team make the postseason this year if Manny doesn't have a good season? And it's really hard to come up with ways to say, yeah, they make the postseason this year if Manny has a down year again. He needs to have a better year. He knows it. Fans know it. Everybody in the organization knows if Manny Machado does not have a good season, this team's chances to make the postseason are not very high. Yeah, and I think you talk about Manny there. It puts more pressure on someone like Jackson Merrill right now because he's one of the guys that is performing the best in this Padres lineup. And going into the year, I was listening to your guys' show, John and Jim on San Diego Sports 760, and you guys were talking about with Merrill how there shouldn't be that much pressure on him when he's down at the bottom of the order like that. And that's a good thing. But the way that this season has started, I'm sorry. I feel like there's more pressure on Merrill to keep performing like this because Hassan Kim's not performing because Xander Bogart's not performing because Manny is not performing. And with Manny, like let's keep it on the Manny topic here. There was the Dennis Lynn piece that came out and Manny's not going to be a hundred percent. Doesn't seem like till 2025. And he's saying, I definitely do still feel, still feel stuff. It's not 100% better than it was last year, but definitely not where I want it to be. I know talking to the doctors, you're going to be more 100% in that second year after the surgery. So that's where I question, okay, so we should be concerned. I think you're totally okay to be concerned about Manny Machado. 
I give Manny the benefit of the doubt if there wasn't like this injury stuff going on. I would say, yeah, there's a lot of season left. Although I know I like this is my new way of saying it's early because I don't want to say those two words. It's early. Yeah. It, there's a lot of season left. I would give him that benefit of the doubt. But when he's saying I'm not where I want to be, probably not going to be 100 percent till next year. I just wonder, you know, I know he's throwing, but he's not throwing to first base yet. He got shut down in spring training. It is a big area of concern, and it just, for me at least, it puts more pressure on other guys. And if Kim didn't have, like, the pressure, I feel like he performs better, like Jake. I think if maybe he's put he put the pressure on himself last year, right? If Kim does that this year, like, that's going to be the krona worth of, you know, 2024, if that makes sense. Well, first thing on Jackson Merrill, I said at the beginning of the year, if we are talking about wins and losses, and it's specifically on offense, and we are, the first thing we talk about is Jackson Merrill, that's not fair to Jackson Merrill. Mm -hmm. He is a 20-year-old rookie. He is a guy that if you put in a position to have to produce a lot, and if he doesn't come through, that's on the team. That's not on Jackson Merrill. That's on the team. They're supposed to put him in positions to succeed. That's why I've been seeing a little bit of this around, like, oh, let's move Jackson Merrill to the top of the lineup. <laughs> the second you move Jackson Merrill to the top of the lineup, you're doing exactly what you don't really want to do for a 20-year-old is put all this pressure on him to produce. Because when you're in the top of the lineup, or if you're closer to the middle of the lineup, the pressure gets high, like the pressure goes up. You are then going to be put in a lot of positions to succeed with runners in the scoring position or, you know, whatever the case may be that the drive-in runs, power threat. And for me right now, just let him be. Let him play. If he's a, if he's hitting eighth and ninth and he's doing what he's doing right now, his four-hit day yesterday was amazing. You know, he's hitting, I think, 324 on the season. It's only 30-something at bats, but still, like, let him succeed down at the bottom of the lineup. The, the thing you want with young guys is to give them all the confidence in the world. And 30-something at-bats isn't like a lot of time. If this was like 150 at-bats and he's hitting 324, then yeah, we can have a conversation about it. But 30-something at-bats is not enough time to, I think, put him in a position where a press, the pressure is going to go up for Jackson Merrill in this lineup. So for me... Keep him in the eight nine spot. Let him do his thing. Just let him be. And okay, don't what, have to put a pressure on him right away. Okay. I totally understand that point. But if we're in the business of winning baseball games and Jackson Merrill is one of your best offensive players, he's having good at bats. And that's not happening good enough for Xander Bogarts right now. Hassan Kim, people say, put him in the leadoff spot. Well, look how he's swinging the bat right now. Like It's not that great. Where with Merrill, it's not like this is someone – that I'm worried about his confidence. I'm not worried about that. And he's going to be facing Logan Webb still hitting in the nine spot. And so if you're giving one of your better offensive players more chances to impact you positively offensively, I think you do that. I don't think if it was Graham Pauly, maybe I'd have a little bit more pause, but maybe it's just the Jackson Merrill personality and seeing some of his quotes and just watching the at-bats. It feels like to me he would... Think of it more as pressure is a privilege than to be, oh, man, I, I'm going to be pressing now because, oh, they're expecting more out of me in the leadoff spot. I think he expects a lot out of himself anyway. Uh, again, 34 at-bats, he's done great. But I just, for me, just continue to get his confidence up, continue to make sure that he is going to perform because he can easily go into an 0 for 20 slump. We don't I mean yeah. we we don't really know the extent of Jackson Merrill yet. It's 34 at bats. He's done great in those 34 at bats. You like it. I think you still need more time and do this thing properly because the last thing you want to do, the last thing that AJ Preller, while he's still here, wants to do is put this guy in a position where if he fails, it becomes even worse. And if he's going to fail, let him do it at his own. Like, let him be in the 8-9 spot right now. Moving him up in the order, probably something they, they're going to do later in the season. Maybe they do it as early as today. I don't know. But for me, 
I just let him do his thing and continue to perform like he is right now. And then we can have that conversation down the road. So, Manny Machado. The what? Yeah, yeah. Hang on. We'll, we'll talk about Manny. But with Merrill there, and you're, you're hitting on Preller. So with Merrill moving up to the leadoff. So he's succeeding right now with A.J. Preller as the GM and Merrill's in the lineup. Him going to the leadoff spot, we're going to point at A.J. for Merrill. Let's say he struggles. We're going to point towards A.J. We're going to point towards the- we're going to point towards the organization. What I mean, what I'm saying is AJ needs in order to still remain the GM of this team. Obviously he needs this team to make the postseason. But another yeah. thing is they need these young guys to develop. They need these young guys to stick. They can't be flashes in the pan. They have to stick for long periods of time because if they don't, then this team's in trouble. And one of those guys that they have to have stick and they have to have produce and develop is Jackson Merrill. Yeah. Um, you know, and the yeah. one thing that 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 Preller and this organization have done is push guys too fast sometimes and they end up fizzling out. I just don't want to see that with Jackson Merrill. It was already kind of a risk to bring him up in the first place and have him starting in center field. And he has so far, 34 bats, so far has proven them right. But that's yeah. not all of a sudden with just 34 bats, say leadoff hitter. Yeah, give him give him time. Yeah, go. What were you gonna say about Manny? Right now, I'll look up. I wonder what Tatis in 2019. When did because he was at the bottom of the order? When did he start to hit at the top of the order in 2019? I Tatis? I wonder that. Yeah. Well, we're not gonna compare Tatis to Merrill here. No, but I'm just I'm well I am I'm thinking like position in the order, mm-hmm. top prospect, valuable to your franchise. I get it's like a different year, 2019, that situation compared to now. But I just wonder how long did it take for the Padres to give the okay for Tatis to go to the top of the order? I I don't know exactly. Um, But even with this, I mean, I get what you're trying to say. Mm -hmm. But even if I look at this lineup right now, there's still two other guys I would put in leadoff spot over Jackson Merrill. And that's Hassan Kim and Fernando Tatis Jr. Like, I... I, I Tatis think, is definitely fair, yeah, for sure. I think Tatis, his numbers prove it that he's an amazing leadoff hitter. Just look at his numbers. Hassan Kim, when he kind of, you know, took off last year, it was because he was in the leadoff spot. I don't look think at this. A- I, I just, Tatis, he led off. This I just picked out a random date in April, April twentieth. He was already leading off. But also look at that team. Let I me mean, look at that team, Ben. Like, yeah, I know. I, you yeah. know that's my mind just went to Tatis. While right. you were talking about that whole Merrill thing and, oh, maybe move him up. That's just where it went. But, yeah, I totally understand the differences. And Yeah, yeah. there was no one. I don't think anyone's – I don't think any player in that 2019 lineup, and I can't remember all the players Jose there. Jose Barella? I yeah, I don't think there's anybody in that 2019 lineup where I'm like, yeah, that could be the leadoff hitter over Tatis. Like, yeah. I mean, it's different with this lineup as well. Yeah. So, going to Manny – um, If he's never going to complain about an injury, then I'm never going to use it as an excuse. I don't view today with Dennis Lynn report as a um, complaining or like, man, I'm not performing because my my elbow is hurting. Like I more or less just linking it to, well, this is the reason why I'm potentially not in the field. And and yeah, you know, I'm still feeling it a little bit. My one question, though, and I don't I, I didn't read the whole article, but my one question is, is it affecting him offensively? Like, is his elbow affecting him offensively, or is it only a situation where it's affecting him while he's not in the field? Because if yeah. it's affecting him offensively, then that's a problem. Because he said, his bat- he said on Sunday morning, this is from Dennis, I definitely do steal, I definitely do still feel stuff. That's pretty much the extent there. He didn't yeah. really elaborate on and he'll, if, ne- he'll never elaborate on yeah. his injuries. He'll he'll that's probably the most you're gonna get from Machado on his elbow for for and this is what also you're going to get. Time. I want to be out there competing. That's what I play this game for. I mean, it's better than not being able to do anything. So he, whatever he can do, he's going to go do that. And right now, what he can do is go swing the bat. So then, yeah, that, my, my, my question would be, is it affecting you offensively? Because if it's affecting you offensively, then that's a problem. Because his bat is far more important than his glove. His glove is important, but his bat is more important. And if 
the elbow is affecting him offensively, then, you know, then there's a the little panic there with Manny, just a little. Because if, if you're telling everybody you're not going to be, or at least the doctors are telling you, and then you're telling everybody what the doctors told you, that that he's not going to be close to 100% or 100% until at least 2025, that's an issue. Um, I don't know if this could have been prevented earlier, because if he got the surgery earlier, is it still the same thing where he's not going to be fully healthy until the, the 2025 season? I don't know, but it's just an unfortunate thing that if um, this elbow is affecting him offensively and it's not going to be ready until 2025 for a guy that you desperately need to perform and a guy that's in hit, you know, cleaning up in your lineup, that's, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, just not it was, good. it was one thing last year where, when did we officially like start to hear about, Oh, Manny, his elbow. It wasn't April of 2023. I think it Where was this, more. It was like August, like the okay. like the middle of August, and it's like the beginning of September. And like when we started, when you started seeing Manny not playing in the field, um, you know, yeah. all the time, you're like, that's interesting. And then, and then he, it was so bad that he was playing one day as a DH, and then he'd sit out and then play again. And it's like we were all like, "What are you doing? We're not making the postseason now." Then at the same time, we all got on Josh Hader for that quote that he had. But, I mean, it's just something that you don't say publicly, obviously. Yeah. But, yeah, with, with Manny, who are we more concerned about here? Manny or Kim? Because Kim, there's nothing injury-wise. With Manny, there's the injury thing to to look at there. Well, the injury does throw, like, a, a little bit of a wrench in this whole thing. Yeah. I have said on John and Jim, the wrap-up show, everywhere, like, you know Manny's going to get his numbers at some point. You know that at some point Manny is going to get hot. He is going to have a three-week stretch where he's one of the best players in baseball offensively. He's going to carry this team at some points of this season. He did it last year, even though last year was a down year for Manny. The problem with that is he needs to be more consistent, and he needs to be like a 2022 Manny that we've seen here. That Manny Machado was fantastic. And it probably could have been even better if he didn't twist his ankle in Colorado. Yeah. And that's the type of Manny Machado offensively you need for this team. So I'm not worried about Manny. I know he's going to get his numbers. The only thing I'm worried about Manny is, I guess, this elbow now, if it's affecting him offensively. And can he be more consistent? Can he, instead of have like these two, three week stretches where he's on fire and then kind of just kind of go back down to earth, can he? be that 2022 version that this team desperately needs. So with that, I'm more concerned about Hassan Kim. Hassan Kim, for his first three and a half plus years, or I guess three plus years in the big leagues, he's really only had like, what is it? Maybe two and a half, three good months? Like consistently? The, the, his, his rookie year in 2021, Let's call it what it is. It was just a bad year. It, he yeah. looked overmatched, couldn't hit a fastball. Defensively, he's been fantastic, but it just was a problem. Going into year two, you didn't know what to expect, and he showed some glimpses, and you're like, okay, that's nice, but it wasn't. It wasn't. he wasn't consistent. He just showed glimpses here and there. And then last year happened. The start of Hassan Kim's year last year was not good. I mean, look it up. It was just not good. And then he got moved to the leadoff spot, and then he, like, just, took off like a rocket and you're thinking to yourself, all right, this is like a $150 million player potentially here. That's what I was being told. Like this guy yeah. could be at a big time contract because his defense matched with this offense. That's fantastic. They got hurt towards the end of the year. They kind of just, you didn't even see him. So really he's had like three good months of three plus years. And it concerns me more that it's been only three months of three good years or three three years in the big leagues because you don't really have that big of a track record to go off of for Hassan Kim. And if he's been put in the five hole, you're going to need Hassan Kim of last year for those three months to be that guy. And so I'm more concerned about Hassan Kim offensively than I am Manny Machado for those reasons. Yeah, and I'm looking right now at the month splits for 2023. And yeah, 
I did not realize this. 625 OPS in the first month, essentially, of last year. Mm -hmm. Then 808, 844, 999. Yeah. And then in August, he went down to 752. Then obviously, last month of, uh, of the year, 471, there was injury there. But yeah, so if you count 750 and up, okay, four. But if it's, you know, what we want out of Ha Sung Kim, it's three months right there, May, June, July. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like he's going to get the Dansby Swanson contract. I guess the question is, is it going to be more than $100 million? Is it going to be less than 100 Is it going to be like a Jake Cronenworth contract? What is that going to look like? Only if Kim? he has a year, like those three months that you mentioned there, the 800 plus OPSs and then of course the 900 plus OPS. Like if he has that year, if, it, if he ends the season with like an 820 OPS, then yeah, he can get over $100 million. Yeah. But I mean, that's a big ask right there because he has never, I mean, three years in the big leagues, never even ever had an 800 plus OPS. So yeah. Moving to the rotation. Do you think that this, this rotation this year, I feel like it's going to be more of what we saw this most recent time around than the first time around. But there's still question marks. I mean, because we just want to see it consistently from this rotation. I mean, Michael King, let's get a version of that every time out and we'll be happy. Like, that was more than what we're going to get consistently out of Michael King, I would think. Musgrove, Darvish, keep doing that. Waldron, I was pleasantly surprised by. Uh, but yeah, just your thoughts overall, like on the, the state of this rotation right now. So far, so good. Um, I think that uh, the ways that this team is going to win is having the rotation be like it was this past week. You're going to win more uh, more games than not if you have that type of performance from your rotation every time out. It's not going to happen every time out, but Jim you Fat. get... Jim statement. Shocker. Um, that is the strength of this team, the starting pitching. That's how they're going to win ball games, and that's how they're going to have to win ball games is through their starting pitching. I think so far, you look at you Darvish the start of the year, fantastic. That's what you've wanted to see from you Darvish to start the season. Hopefully, it continues um, throughout the rest of the year. Joe Musgrove, um, his first two starts, not good, but you know he's a guy of, of creature of habit. He's a rhythm guy. You get him on regular rest have him pitching every five days. It, hopefully it looks like it did versus the Cardinals in the first two games of the year. Not worried about it, Joe, at all. Dylan Cease, he's going he, he's gonna to be a guy that you trust a lot to go just six innings for you. The ERA, it might not be, like, fantastic. You know, his walks, he kind of has a little Blake Snell in him there, but, yeah, you know, he's going to strike out over 200 guys. He's going to give you 170-plus innings. Like, you're not worried about Dylan Cease. The top three of this rotation, to me, you feel really confident about. Michael King, going to have to see more from him to know that he's going to be consistently a really good pitcher for you. One, one, I guess, not so good start with his seven walks, and then his Saturday outing was fantastic. Got to see more from him, but you like what you see. And then Matt Waldron, I mean, if you're going to get that out of your just fifth starter, whoever that is, every day of the week, you take it. So the, the rotation, to me, is... So far, so good. Even when they weren't performing in the first week of the season, you're like, I'm not really too worried about it. Like they, they I feel that they're going to be better because they're healthy, and you you just worry about other things. But the rotation to me, so far, so good. It's where the, it's the bullpen, right? Where I'm I'm still trying to figure out, okay, who are these guys that you're going to be able to trust? Obviously, Suarez. So grateful to have that guy be in this bullpen this year um, and be healthy. But then after that, it's, I'd love to see Tom Cosgrove step up and be consistent and be that type of guy. Wandy's been iffy. Matsui kind of been iffy. De Los Santos, what's going to happen there? I mean, Wusaka is a totally different thing. When is he going to come up from double A? Right on the roster. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just, we're just in the waiting game, right, with the bullpen right now. So yesterday was the first time, and I had this rant on on the wrap-up show but yesterday was the first time this year where you start seeing from the social media crowd and from Padres fans and it's a small it's not like this every fan but it's growing here with the sense that the bullpen issues are because of Mike Schilt 
The reason why this team is losing games is because Mike Schultz has horrific bullpen management. And I'm thinking, I'm like, this is deja vu. This this feels a lot like last year when everybody was crying and screaming their heads off about the reason why the Padres are losing these games is because Bob Melvin's bullpen management. And if you just take a step back and you realize, you know, first, yesterday's game in particular, um, it was not Johnny Brito's fault they lost that game. If Hassan Kim holds onto the ball at second base, they go to the ninth inning with a 2-1, 2-1 lead. Robert Suarez is in the game. Suarez in the game mm-hmm. to, to close it out. Is that is that on uh, Johnny Brito or is that on Hassan Kim? Yeah, he gave up the single to Matt Chapman, and maybe you could talk about the decision to pitch to Matt Chapman there, but it all predicated from Hassan Kim dropping the ball. So anybody putting yesterday's game on Johnny Brito and, and, and Mike Schilt, um, watch the game, first off. And two, don't be afraid to to criticize your beloved Padre player and Hassan Kim for messing up. Doesn't mean you want to trade him. Doesn't mean he needs to be benched. Like, he made a mistake. Call it out. It is what it is. He dropped the ball. Yesterday's game is on Hassan Kim. But going back to the bigger picture here of when the bullpen doesn't work out and when the, the players in the bullpen blow leads or whatever, and then seeing this, like, it's Mike Schultz's fault. He doesn't know how to manage a bullpen. Do you know, does everybody know who gave these arms and these players to Mike Schultz to manage? Does, does everybody know who built this bullpen? Does everybody know who traded Juan Soto for these pieces in the bullpen to give Mike Schultz? Oh, that's right. It's A.J. Preller. A.J. Preller built this bullpen for Mike Schultz. A.J. Preller gave Johnny Brito to Mike Schultz. A.J. Preller gave a Rule 5 guy to Mike Schultz. Is Mike Schultz the greatest manager and knows how to manage a bullpen perfectly? No. He's not. Nobody is. Maybe besides Bruce Bochy, because he has four World Series. But other than that, nobody's perfect with managing their bullpen. So if you're going to blame Mike Schilt for the problems with the bullpen or his bullpen management, then you got to look at the guy that gave him these arms in the first place. And that's A.J. Preller. Because A.J. Preller made this trade to trade Juan Soto for these pieces, for Johnny Brito specifically, and gave him to Mike Schilt and put him in the bullpen. Mike Schultz sitting there like, who am I going to go to? Oh, Kolick, Stephen Kolick. Guess what? He's a Rule 5 guy. The- Mike Schultz going to make mistakes. Everybody does, okay? But so far, I think his bullpen management has been very aggressive. They don't win two of these games this year without Mike Schultz putting in Robert Swarry into a four and a five-out save situation in South Korea and yeah. the other day. Like, so... Yes, Mike Schilt, there's things about Mike Schilt that are cringy that he does after game and the nicknames and the Wadies and the Nickies and the Suarezies and, and all that stuff, right? But that's not in-game things with Mike Schilt. In-game things with Mike Schilt, I have yet to see something that's like egregious where it's like, okay, that's on Mike Schilt. So if everybody wants to say Mike Schilt sucks at managing a bullpen so far, um, one, look at yesterday, Johnny Brito got out of that inning, but Hassan Kim dropped the ball. And two, who gave Mike Schilt these pitchers to put in the game in situations? AJ Preller. So that's my like mini rant on this whole bullpen situation. It's not great. I so far for the first two weeks of the season, I look like an idiot because I thought the bullpen was going to be one of the best bullpens in baseball, top five in baseball, because they just accumulated a bunch of arms. And I thought that was going to be, you know, what took this bullpen to another level. And I was wrong so far, but hey. There's always time to improve the bullpen because the bullpen's the easiest thing to improve in baseball. Yeah, and with Brito, Schilt is going to have to use him at some point. And you're right about that whole, like everything you said, yeah, that's right. And I put out the bullpen usage charts before every game, and Brito was empty. You go look at the last five days. There's no pitches there. You're going to put him in the game. Yeah. You can't just have him sit there. We The Padres believe in Johnny Brito. Why do you think they acquired him? You know, like they're going to throw him. He's a talented guy. And yeah, Hassan Kim. And Padres fans, if you don't want to get on Hassan Kim, go read post game quotes from yesterday. Hassan Kim's getting on himself. He took the blame. He's admitting. Yeah. So that gives you your free pass to go be disappointed in Hassan Kim and say, yeah, it's that, that's on him today. And guess what? He's still a great defensive player. He's still like Tatis was talking about it as well. We know how great of a player he is. It's one game. Um, Last thing I wanted to hit on here, Fred Ullman Jr. 
assistant GM, long time with AJ, been with the Padres for 29 years, and he quietly stepped down. Uh, it was nice of Mike Schilt in that presser um, when they were back in San Diego to acknowledge Fred Ullman Jr. Um, Fuger, I think, is what he was calling him. What my question to you is <laughs> all these nicknames, <laughs> it's hard to keep track. Um, my question yeah. to you is do you really believe Fred Ullman Jr. when he's saying, no, AJ's great, everything was fine? I've been here for 29 years, but I want something new. I was offered a position in scouting with the Padres, could have stayed in my current position, but I'm looking for a challenge for the first time since ni- the 1990s. Do you like fully believe that with? the stories that have come out in the past with AJ. It, maybe Fred is looking for a challenge, but I don't know. It seems like he'd be making his job, his life harder by looking for that challenge than staying in the organization that he's known for decades now. Well, I mean, one thing is that there always comes a time where it's time to move on. Like no one stays in a position forever. Like you are always doing different things and who knows what, he wanted to do who knows his passions you know were to go out from outside the organization that he's been with for this long like maybe this was a time where he's just thinking to himself like okay it's it's run its course I, i'm gonna move on here and you know good luck aj like I, i'm gonna try to do my own thing i don't think it's if you want to read into it and you want to say that he's gone because he thinks that the writing's on the wall with AJ Preller this season and he wants to get a head start on finding a new position potentially or whatever, like you can do that. But for a guy that's been with his organization for that long, even before AJ, you're like, okay. Um, I mean, it's just, it to me, it does nothing personally. It just does nothing towards like trying to read into. Um, well, the reason why he's leaving is because AJ Preller's on, you know, on the hot seat. Like he knew he was on the hot seat. Everybody knows he's on the hot seat. Everybody knows that if the team doesn't make the postseason this year, there's going to be changes and there should be changes, right? Like it's postseason or bust for this team. And if there's changes within the organization, you know, it's probably because either they want to pursue something different or they just think that their time's up or whatever the case may be. But I, I don't think it's something to read too much into right now. Um, that change, I think it's just kind of life. And I think it's just kind of um, whatever his uh, reasonings were is his reasonings. And I'm not going to sit here and kind of like go conspiracy theory on everything. Yeah, your your point there about how he was here before AJ and then he was here with AJ for a long. I mean, AJ has been here for almost a decade now. Yeah, that's that's totally valid. I just that's just where a thought came, you know, a couple thoughts when that happened was well, is there more to that? Just because like, I wouldn't even think about that in the back of my head if there were no A.J. Preller articles in The Athletic, you know, one year and then the next year, that's all. Um, all right, Jim Russell, episode 584, Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show. Main sponsor of the show, Gaglion Bros, Famous Cheese Steaks and Garlic Fries in Petco Park inside Snapdragon Stadium. Main location is on Friars Road. You can check out Jim Russell with John Schaefer on Padres Wrap-Up Show. Who? On John and Jim. Yeah, who? Who's John? Uh, but yeah, Jim, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me.